other's hands, 
And I'll... <laughs> Oh, he is. Okay. Miss Vaughn, do you have anything to say? <laughs> She's like not in church, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I would really, really love to see them. Yeah, could you imagine two elderly ladies? Come on, come on. Maybe arm wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> Instigated by senior pastor. Broken up by... Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I know, I know that uh, we're having fun laughing. We need to pray and get God in this place. So, uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. I pray that uh, you bless our service. Thank you for each and every single person here. Lord, thank you for the folks that we had this morning, uh, the visitors that we had. We pray, the Lord, that the message would continue to resonate uh, to their hearts uh, this evening. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you watch over those folks that could not make it this evening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. we got another song, 258. Page number 258, Oh, How I Love Jesus, 258. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the last verse of 258. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because He first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Go ahead and take your Bible. Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 18. Matthew, chapter number 18. Matthew, chapter number 18. Matthew chapter 18. The Bible says in verse number 11, it says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if it's so that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of the sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, evening that you've given us, Lord. Thank you again for the crowd of people that we had this morning, our visitors, Lord. I pray that you bless the message. Speak to the hearts of your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Really interesting. Jesus says, therefore, the Son of Man is to come to save that which is lost and then he starts talking about how a shepherd will leave the 90 and 9 for the one you know one of the hardest things as a pastor oftentimes is finding out of, of course you know there's sometimes where people do go astray and then there's sometimes the difference deciphering the difference or differentiating who is a sheep going astray and who is a prodigal that doesn't want to have anything to do with anything? That's really, really hard sometimes to, to deal with or to figure out. And uh, Jesus is talking here and he's given a story about a sheep that gone astray. And uh, throughout the message, the theme basically is rounding up strays, rounding up strays. You know, in our life, we're going to come across a lot of strays. 
It's amazing if you think about a stray. A lot of times people, when you hear the word stray, you think of a pet. Do you know what you call a pet that is a stray that you, or a, a stray that you feed? It's a pet. Amen. Right? But we'll get into that. Number one, let's look at the, stray, the sheep that have strayed. The sheep that have strayed, the Bible talks about this in verse number 12 in the first part of the verse. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray. You know, there's a lot of strays out there. In this story, there's a lot of emphasis and attention put on the sheep that went astray. But how did it go astray? You wonder oftentimes how or why did it go astray. The strange sheep is a type of picture of two kinds of people, the lost and the believer that has strayed from the Lord. The lost and the believer that has strayed from the Lord. Uh, number one, these sheep, if you think about it, I, I look at it and I say, what happened to this one sheep that went astray? Why? What are the possibilities as to why it went astray? Now, through uh, the tenure that I've been pastoring, I, I can look at you and I can tell you, okay, there's several reasons why people go astray, and then I can kind of relate it to a sheep, why a sheep would go astray. Number one, they possibly, they could have gone astray because of uh, uh, desertion. Desertion. The Bible says, I want you to look at it, uh, keep your place there in Matthew, but look at John chapter 10, if you will. I want you to look at John chapter 10, and the theme of John chapter 10, it actually has to do with a good shepherd, but John chapter 10, the Bible says this in John chapter 10 in verse number 11, it says, I am the good shepherd, amen, thank God for that, uh, the, 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 the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own, whose own the, uh, the sheep are not, seeth the wolf cometh, coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The Bible says this in verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep. You know, there's many believers out there that have been deserted by hirelings that were not real shepherds by any means whatsoever. Now, there's a difference. There's, there's people, again, whenever I'm talking about the difference between sheep and prodigals. Sheep wander astray. They're wandering astray. Prodigals are just rebellious. And we have to decipher the same thing oftentimes, even just in everyday situation, which one, which brothers and, Christ, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ are sheep going astray or which ones are flat out prodigal? Now, there's a lot that the Bible says about how to deal with prodigals or how to deal with rebellious people in general. But whenever it comes to sheep that are wandering astray, there are several reasons why they go astray, but one of them is, is desertion. Because they have somebody in their life that should be a leader or someone that should guide them or someone that should direct them, but they are there as a hireling. They are not there as somebody who legitimately cares for their soul, cares for the direction that they're going to. There are so many believers that have been deserted by hirelings that were not real shepherds. Wolves come into the church on a regular basis. I'll just just give you a general general concept as far as just church. Wolves will enter into the church on a regular basis. It's my job as an under shepherd to make sure I identify the wolves and and do whatever I can to run them off. But in des in desertion, wolves will come into the church, and instead of running off the wolves and protecting the flock, the by you know uh, the the hirelings will end up leaving the church and leaving the church in complete disarray. Those that have gone astray because of uh, dereliction of duty by pastors and under shepherds, if you think about this, I, I've come across a lot of people that said, hey, you know, no one ever made a phone call to me. And, and by the way, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to find out why a person has not come back to church. Now, there are those people out there that, uh, I mean, for example, uh, in the church I used to pastor, there was a man that uh, told me he, his former pastor, every time he was not at church on Sunday, his wife and him would show up at his door on Monday with baked cookies. Amen. And he said, I miss church and you didn't come to my house with cookies. I said, I didn't know that's the reason why you go to church or don't go to church is so you can get chocolate chip cookies. 
And if my wife makes any chocolate chip cookies, she's doing it for me. Amen, right? <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, I said, how long have you been saved, sir? You know, 30 years. I said, okay, so you've been saved 30 years. How much preaching have you heard about going to church? Do you know that you need to be in church? Of course, of course. You know, you go through it and different things like that. Sometimes people do things just to get attention because they want somebody to reach out to them and they want somebody to give them attention. But then again, if somebody realizes this and they're in this state of mind to where they're just like, I'm doing this to get attention, that's one thing. But if someone just said, hey, legitimately they were sick, legitimately they were ill, legitimately they're having a rough time, and nobody in the world reached out to them, then there's something wrong not only with the underling, but also with the people of the church. It shouldn't just be the pastor's responsibility to reach out to someone who's not here. Amen. It shouldn't be just the, the pastor's responsibility to do that because I'm only one person. And, and by the way, they, they, sometimes they're not here because of me. So, <laughs> But uh, it, they might be mad at something I said, but either way. This is what God said about shepherds in Ezekiel chapter 34. It says this in verse number 5, And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon all, every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none of them did search or seek after them. As I liveth, saith the Lord, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field. You know, the shepherd's job is to feed and to care for the flock of God. The Bible says this in 1 Peter chapter 5. It says this, number one, to the pastor, feed the flock of God. Feed the flock of God. You know, I've had people tell me before in times past, in the years that I've been pastor, well, I'm just not getting fed here. Well, you're only coming to one, one course a day. One, listen, folks. You and I both know this. If you ate one time a week, that would not be enough to feed your flesh. But I also know this. I also know this, ladies. If you make a meal for your husband and he doesn't show up for it, he's in doo-doo, right? He's in deep trouble, amen? And it's amazing to me that, uh, it, it, but believe it or not, you know, folks, I think that sometimes people think that creating a sermon is very, very easy and it's very, uh, very simple. But the truth is, is I want to make sure that I give you content and I give you food that you could feast on for the rest of the rest of the week. And uh, our time here is very short. You think about it like this. Uh, we have Sunday school that starts at 10. We have a main service that preaches, uh, starts at 11. And usually I try to be mindful of everybody's plans for Sunday afternoon, their meals, the ladies have their food in their crock pot and different things. And I try to have you out of here at a decent time. Even on Sunday night, I try to preach short to you so I can have you out of here at a decent time because I know there's people that wake up extremely early in the morning to go to work. And I'm very thankful for that. I'm very mindful of that. But also, whenever there's a sermon that's prepared, it's prepared. There are certain ingredients that are involved in it. And you've got to look at a sermon like you would a nice, coarse meal that your wife gives you. Now, sometimes she may think it's nice, and you may taste it. It may not be palatable, but for your love for her, you're going to eat it and smile and say, thank you, honey, this is the greatest food ever today, tonight, at this moment. <laughs> Amen? But the same way, you know, a pastor, I'm, I'm serious, it's prepared, it's thought up, it's outlined, different things like that. And if you say, oh, that's nothing, you go ahead and do it then. Right? It, it's so easy, right, Josiah? So Josiah has to prepare a Sunday school lesson every every week now and there'll be times where either on a sunday night or wednesday night or even on a sunday morning i'll have him preach but do it sunday morning sunday night and wednesday night and then preach other places as well um there have been other churches ask me to come and preach you know like do the work of an evangelist different things like that i have turned a lot of them down throughout the years uh there's a couple churches now that have contacted me and they want me to go there and preach for revival or just on a specific topic or something of that nature, I'm going to start taking some of those that are local, somewhat local, within a couple hours anyway. But sermon, there's a lot that goes into sermon. There's a lot of preparation that goes into developing a sermon, and that sermon is developed to feed the flock of God. Amen? 
Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, different things of that nature. I don't know how many times I've gone through Proverbs, maybe four, verse by verse. And Josiah's been there once or twice, once in a Christian school, once in a church setting. And even to this very day, I still study every verse of Proverbs that I give that night prior to the service because I want to make sure I give you something fresh and that is applicable to your lives right now. Uh, also, the sermons that are prepared. So there's a lot of thought. There's a lot of preparation is to feed the flock of God which is among us. And then the Bible says taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, which means stingingly. It being stingy by it, okay? But it says this, that my job is to take the oversight thereof. You know, uh, we, do, we are Baptists. The under-shepherd believe that the pastor has oversight in every area of the church. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre. We don't do what we do for the income. We do what we do for the outcome. Amen? But of mind. We do what we do for the outcome, not the income. You know, it stirs my heart. And I was telling the folks about this on, on, on Wednesday about one of the, the men that we have that we pick up from the rescue mission. One of the men that we pick up from the rescue mission, believe it or not, um, is a, a former alcoholic. And he hasn't drank in several months since he got saved and baptized. And he had it all planned out one time that... Um, that um, he was going to get off work, and he was going to go out, and he was going to buy some liquor, and he was going to get drunk. And he said, when I decided I was going to do that, something inside of me said, don't you dare. Amen. And then, now, since uh, Jody, anyway, so, and then for him to, he works a full-time job. So he's not just a free loafer. Okay, he's there working a job. He works a job, and guess what? He also tithes. How about that? And we sit there and we say, well, it's so much money, it costs 35 to $40 every Sunday to drive the van there, pick them up, and drive them back. Where is our return of investment on that? Well, so far, we've had a lot of people saved through that ministry. We've had more people baptized through that ministry. And then at the same time, you have a man who beforehand had no hope in the world. All of a sudden, he has hope. And he was telling me that today. He said, Pastor, for the first time in my life, I feel like there's actually hope for my future. Do you believe that? So we don't do what we do for the income. We do what we do for the outcome. Amen. Uh, just like when we pick up kids, they can't, they can't contribute anything monetarily to our church. Matter of fact, if anything, they cost us money. You know, they, they flush extra toilet paper down the toilet. They put paper towels there. They scuff up the walls, the baseboards, the door costs money for candy, it costs money for promotions, it costs money for gas, it costs money for insurance, all of those different things. And then the potential of somebody possibly coming in the church and messing with those kids, there's the potential of that. You're taking on a great risk doing what we do. But we don't do it for the income, we do it for the outcome. Because one of these days, one of these little kids is going to do something for the Lord. You mark my word of it. But uh, these sheep could have gone astray because of uh, des uh, desertion. Desertion is a, is a vital, you know, pastors are in it for the money. I remember seeing a Facebook post recently. It was a video of a pastor who was throwing a tangent fit. It, fit. it wasn't even a Baptist church. It was a pastor throwing a tangent fit because his church did not buy him a Rolex for his birthday. Now listen to me, folks. If you all want to buy me a Rolex for my birthday... I'd say save, skip the thing. I'll, I'll give you a, like a $50 watch to buy, something a lot nicer in my opinion than a $10,000 or $15,000 Rolex. But the particular Rolex that he wanted was one that was $26,000. And he was up there chiding on his people because they didn't get him the $26,000 Rolex. They got him the $15,000 Rolex. That is somebody who's in it for filthy lucre. They could have been in, been in it for, uh, they could have gone astray because of uh, desertion. People that really do not care about people. Now, <clears throat> I try, it had been said that people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. I try to express people that I care about them in my, my unusual way that I do. And I'll do things for people 
behind the scenes. I'm not going to get up here and do something and then brag about what I've done. Because the Bible says if I do it that way, Miss Sterling, I, that's my reward. That's my pat on the back. That's all I do. But there have been times where I've done plenty for people in secret, behind the scenes, only them and they know it. And then at the same time, for me to do something kind out of that, out of just to say, say, hey, I care about you. Write them a letter. Write them a thank you note. Something of that nature. Or give them, you know, express. You know, everybody has a different ways of expressing love. I do. Some people are, I love you, man. And that's all, that, that's what they mean. Some people are like huggy. Some people are very emotional. Some people are the type to give different things of that nature. I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my element whenever I do more than just say, hey, I love you. And it, it's something for me that I have to do, but guess what? It's something that each and every single one of us do. Go outside of our element to express love and care and compassion for somebody else. Because there are sheep that go astray because they feel like no one actually cares about them. Okay? So d uh, desertion, number next, sheep could go astray because of disobedience. Because of disobedience. You know, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 119, 176, uh, I have gone astray. Oh, good night in the morning. Uh, the, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. So the psalmist says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. In Proverbs chapter 5 and verse number 23, the Bible says, He shall die without destruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. So they, these people, these sheep, they could go astray because of sinful disobedience. Maybe they were astray because they broke through a fence or tore down a gate that was put there to protect them. Sometimes I see sheep go astray, especially in church, especially whenever it comes to this matter of truth. You can argue with me a lot. That's fine. But you cannot argue with the Word of God. It's like this when someone comes up to me and says, Hey, preacher, you know, I, I'm just, I'm leaving, I'm not coming back because you don't believe in speaking in tongues. Okay, w what's your definition of speaking in tongues? Okay, then we go through it and we look at it and we talk about what the scripture says. Ah, oh, no, I just know what I experienced. That's, that's all that matters. <clears throat> you can argue with me all you want to, but you cannot argue with the word of God. And there are hedges and walls and fences that a pastor tries to put up for people not to put you in bondage, not to control your life, but to say, hey, there's danger on the other side of the hedge. There's danger on the other side of the fence. If you go over there, you're going to get hurt. But there's sheep that want to jump the fence. There's sheep that want to buck the fence and knock it down so they can go because Oh, the preacher's just trying to control my life, right? But these type of sheep, they don't like the rules. They don't like the boundaries. They don't like anyone to limit what they deem as free. Preacher, it's my life, and I will do what I want. You know, they understand this, that whenever it comes to people that just come to church, it's one thing, but for the membership to come, to be a member of the church, that's another thing. And I, I lay it out for everybody. Hey, you know, if you're a member of this church, here's our Constitution bylaws. This is what's expected of you as a member. And by the way, those Constitution bylaws are also good for me, too. It's not only good for the goose, it's good for the matter. It's good for everybody, okay, that says, hey, I'm a member of this church. So whenever I say, hey, you know, you have an issue, there's an issue that we need to talk about because you're a member of this church and you said, hey, I'm going to comply with this set of standards according to what this church believes in regard to the Scripture, and then they have a problem with that, it's because they, say, they, they think or they say that I'm trying or the church is trying to impede on their freedom. By the way, the Bible talks about this matter of freedom. It says that we have great liberty in Christ. Not to necessarily do whatever we want, but hey, when you are in Christ and you're living for him and you're walking in him, you're going to feel like you have great liberty. Um, but these type of sheep, they're not content with the place they were put. They wanted more. They wanted more. They wanted to do more than what they were allowed to do, so they decided to jump over the fence and they go astray. Oftentimes, those are the sheep that are prodigals. They're not really sheep. Next, these sheep could have gone astray because of distraction. I have seen so many people go astray because of distraction. So many people that say, hey, I would much rather make more money than to have my relationship right with the Lord. 
I would much rather have this in my life than have my relationship be right with the Lord. And I've seen it time and time again how people will go astray over a job, over money, over a person, over a family member, over something in their life that they just say, this is more important than my relationship and walk with God because they're so distracted. And uh, we, someone mentioned something about this uh, to me recently. What about whenever they get hurt? When people get hurt, you know, it's heartbreaking to, to, to know how many people have strayed away from God and from his word and from the church and the will of God because they got hurt by others that did something to distract them away from the right path. Now, if, we want, if you want to talk about being hurt, I guarantee you, under the sound of my voice, every single person that's here this evening can sit there and say, Preacher, I have been hurt by someone in the church or by the church itself. Absolutely. And guess what? My hand will be raised too, and I'm the pastor. I've been hurt. My wife's been hurt. My children's been hurt. My family's been hurt. But hey, we just take the punches as they roll and we move on. Because the best of men are men at best. People will let you down. And if you haven't figured it out, by the way, one day I'm going to let you down. That's just the way it is. Do I do it on purpose? Absolutely not. Jesus will never let you down. Amen? That's why he's the great shepherd. That's why he's the good shepherd, right? And that's why I'm the under shepherd, little s, right? Amen? But uh, people oftentimes get distracted by hurt. Well, this person hurt me. This way offended me. The word offend means to set off course. You were on the path, on the straight and narrow, the, the path of light, the path of joy, the path of peace, the path of righteousness, the path of hope, the path this is the will of God has for me. means to set off the path. That's what happened. All I could do is this. this. A great peace have a which love thy law and nothing nothing set them off course. Do you get upset about it? Sure. But it's not going to mark you off course. These people could have gone astray because of distraction. And by the way, the Bible is clear. It is possible for the righteous to be led astray by others. The Bible says in this, in Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 10, Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. It is possible for the righteous to, 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 do, to go astray. And the Bible makes it very clear that if you are leading someone astray, okay, that you yourself will fall into your own pit. I don't know how many times I've seen that a person get distracted or somebody get pulled out of a good church or pulled out of church in general because of somebody outside of the church or somebody that was disgruntled at the or somebody that was a family member that pulled them out of church. They got distracted when we're supposed to keep our eyes on who? Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Influence is a powerful, powerful thing. The last thing I would want, you know, I, I was having a conversation with my wife about this. There was a time where I wanted, I, I clearly had to leave the church that I was at. I told the pastor, I said, you're the pastor, I'm not, I'm leaving. I left. The very next day, I had a business appointment with somebody in the church. It couldn't be avoided. This was a person that I invited to the church that was going to the church. Miss Charlene, and I remember sitting down with her, and I just said, I said to her, I said, Miss, uh, Mrs. So and so, I just want to let you know that I'm not going to the church there any longer. Um, but what I want you to do is, I want you to keep going there. And then she said to me, Well, why aren't you going to go? I said, That's completely irrelevant to you and you going to the church. What I want to make sure is, is that you go to church, to that place, because there's not a better church in that area for you. And guess how long ago that was? That was 12 years ago, Miss Charlene. And you know what? She's still going there. Still going there. Still going there. Because the last thing I would have wanted on my conscience is for that lady not to go to church anymore because I said, do you know what's going on at that church? Man, this pastor does this, and this pastor did this, and that pastor did this, and this person did that, and this person said that. 
The last thing I want is the blood on my hands for causing somebody to go to stray because of something that I said to them. I did not want them to get distracted. Why else could sheep go astray? They could go astray because of deception. Many people have been led astray by false teachers and false doctrine. They put their confidence in someone that deceived them. They've been tricked into believing something that was just not true. These people, because of deception, because they followed a liar and a deceiver and were led astray by trickery and their deception. You got all these people on TV today, the gimme, gimme, my name's Jimmy. And they are deceived and they're leading people astray. You know, the Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse number 6, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Paul said this, ye did run well. Who did hinder you? They were deceived. They were deceived by a false teacher or a false preacher or a false prophet or a false whatever. They were deceived by some kind of lie and trickery and deceit and and all, and all these different things, and it caused them to, to go astray. That's why it's very important you watch, you are careful about what kind of preaching you watch on TV. It's very important why you're very careful about what books you read regarding religiosity or anything regarding the Bible. I, if you don't know who to read, what I would just recommend this is don't read anybody you don't know. There was a lot of books that I have, a lot of books that I have, and most, I'd say 90% of the books that I own, Miss Charlene, are people that I know that are Bible-believing Baptist people. Bible-believing Baptist Christians. I'm not going to read something by some neo-evangelical. I don't, I mean, who's going to tell me how to have a complete church and convince me? I don't know how many, how many people I know that I went to college with that have a degree from a fundamental Bible-believing Baptist church, Baptist college, that started reading the wrong books and listening to the wrong podcasts and watching the wrong sermons and getting this idea. This, they're not even Baptist anymore. Some of them are even agnostic or even atheist. I graduated from a Bible college because of who they watched and who they read and who they listened to. Different things like that. Someone will quote to me some 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 preacher, and they're like, "Man, he's just such a great preacher." You know, this person, he's so great in prophecy, he's so great in eschatology. I'm sitting there thinking, they're neo evangelicals. They're part of the happy clappy church. They don't even have a right doctrine whenever it comes to the matter of salvation. But man, they could push up a storm whenever it comes to eschatology. Y'all know those left behind books. Now listen, they're, they're great to read. You know they're not all correct. <laughs> they're great to read. The people that wrote them, they're not right in their salvation doctrine a lot of times. And, and some, the whole group of people, they're great to read. But let me tell you something, that's not Bible. You want to know more about the end times and different things, get in your Bible. That's, instead of reading books about the end times, read the Bible about the end times, right? So many people, they get trapped up in these one little things. And, and uh, Brother, Brother John and I enjoy talking some coffee shop theology every now and then. Amen, Brother John? Amen? But we're not going to go on those hills and die for it. But some of these people, they, they take Bible verses out of context to build a whole doctrine about this coffee shop theology and say, this is the way that it is. Well, they might be wrong. And by the way, when we get to heaven, I'm not going to really care anyway. Amen? But there's a lot of people out there that are deceived. So then when they do come into a believing Baptist church, they're just like, I read this book. Who cares what book you read it in? Did you read it in the book? Amen. So they could have gone astray because of disbelief. The Bible says this in Psalm chapter 58, verse number 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. No, give us no Psalm chapter 53 and verse number 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sometimes he go astray because of disbelief. They just, you know, I preached a sermon by the truth, sell it not. 
They're not buying the truth. They just don't believe it. It doesn't matter what, what the Bible says. They believe whatever they want to believe. And whenever they believe whatever they want to believe, then they're going to try to procre- proclaim that as truth. When it's not, it's abstract. So, first, we have the sheep that have gone astray. Second, we have the state that is sorrowful. Back in Matthew chapter number 18, I'll read it. You don't have to turn there. But Matthew chapter 18, it says, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them gone astray, Notice this, doth, not, doth he not lead the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? There's nothing more pitiful than astray. On my way home from the church last night, I had my brights on whenever I go to the house, and uh, Marion's going to be excited about this. I was going down the road, down the Columbus Road, it curves over to Webster there, and there was probably nine or ten little kittens scattered abroad on the road. Poor little stray. I thought, there was the other day, there was another little kitten. I thought it was a kitten. It, I felt climbing into the small grass or the tall grass, and I, I parked my car there on my road. I parked my car, get out. I was like, oh, hey, little kitty. kitty. It wasn't. It was a baby raccoon. There's nothing more pitiful than a stray. You know, folks, there hasn't been one, in all the years that I've pastored, there hasn't been one person that has gone astray, one person that left the church that I've rejoiced over, like, woohoo, this is great. Because going astray is a very pitiful thing. It's a very sorrowful thing very sad thing but if you think about a stray you know you sometimes I, I don't know if you are that person where strays are attracted to your home where we lived at in Louisiana we lived in a cul-de-sac type area but we still had three or four acres it was kind of out in the country but people the animal shelter would never pick up stray so people would take their dogs and they would drop them off around our property on a regular basis they would drop them off and sometimes these dogs were abused. Sometimes they were beat up. You, you could tell they weren't taken care of. But I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the dogs, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this dog? It's a stray. You know, and I, I just didn't know. So every time it came on the property, we'd shoot off. We got to the place where we get like a BB gun and shoot the, shoot the dog in the rear end or something like that, try to shoot off the property. We got chicken, and we got our own animals, right? We got all these kids, and we got our own animals. So it's like, shoo, shoo, shoo. But they're pitiful. We should have pity on strays, right? But there's nothing more pitiful than a stray animal that has wandered away from its caretaker. They're they're alone. You think about this. You think about these similarities with stray pets and stray people. It's very similar. They're alone. They're isolated from the flock or the herd. And I told you this, Satan will always attack the weak and the sickly and the isolated. They have no one to care for them when they're hurt. They have no one to protect them from predators or wolves. They have to find their own food and water because it's the pastor's job, the under job to feed the flock of God. There's no one around to hear them when they call out. The state of a, tra- of a strange sheep is, is, is the thought of move the heart of Jesus to compassion. It says this in Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 36, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion because he fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. When Jesus saw the multitude, do you know what he saw? Lost sheep. Lost sheep. Twice in the Gospels of Matthew, Jesus clearly said why he came. In Matthew chapter 15, verse number 24, but he answered, said, I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The state that is sorrowful. Anyone ever went to church, and I was just like, thank God they're gone. Thank God he's gone. Thank God she's gone. There's been many, many, many nights where I've soaked my pillow in tears over somebody who has gone astray. Many. 
And I have to be careful as a pastor because sometimes it happens and has happened. You can ask my kids. Over the tenure of me pastoring, you, you can ask them how many people, and I'll get to this, how many people have come and gone. There have been many times that has happened. Someone gets upset about something. Someone didn't like something. Something, something was said, and they took it completely. It, it's important that we do this, that when someone's talking to us, that we're not over-psychoanalyzing everything that they say. Like, well, why did they say that? Why did they say that to me? Did you notice how they said it to me? Did you see the look on their face? That's why I always look crabby and mad. So when I am happy, you think I'm mad. And when I actually am mad, it hasn't changed if I'm happy or mad. <laughs> but so many times we, we over and Believe it or not, me as pastor, sometimes I do that too. I'll shake someone's hand or they'll say something to me. And I'm like, hmm, why did they say that to me? Now, I'm not an insecure person, but I do have insecurities. And if you were honest, you'd probably admit the same thing. But why did they, why did they say that? Why did they only shake my hand? Why did they look me in my eye when I shook their hand? You know, interesting thing about pastoring. I, I was telling this to somebody. There's so many moving parts going on here, Miss Charlene. I've got folks here that want the temperature at, it, it said at 69, but it says it's 72 degrees here. They, it, they say it's too cold. Or they say it's too hot. Okay? What am I supposed to do? Folks, I, I'm, how many of y'all are too cold? How many of y'all are too hot? Well, if I adjust it for one and not adjust the other, everybody gets mad, right? I got people from all walks of life and backgrounds and ages and diversities and races and all sorts of different things. I have to get them all to come in one place and preach to every single one of them to make it applicable to their life. So while someone is saying, man, I really needed that preacher today. You know, man, you were preaching right at me today. And they take it like that. And then the next thing you know, I get someone that calls me and says, was my wife talking about me? Was my husband talking about me? Yeah, or... Preacher, I thought you were preaching right at me. Someone tell me, I know you wrote your sermons just for me. You're right, I did. I got a secret camera in your house and in your car, and I write up all these sermons just for you. You know, a lot of times, you know who a preacher preaches to? Me. Because I, I, I try to look at it. If I'm struggling with this, oftentimes I'm thinking, Maybe there's some people in our church that are struggling with it as well. And there have been people, honestly, they said to me, who talked to you? Who talked to you? Just because my dog is barking up your tree, right? Oh, I got that, I, got, I, I, I treed that coon, right? Doesn't mean that I know anything about your situation. So don't assume that's the case. So I've got all these moving parts in here, and then somewhere along the line, someone's going to get upset about something, something's going to be said that's not true, and instead of actually talking to me and saying, hey, is this true? Absolutely not. End of story. What they want to do is they want to just believe whatever they want to believe and just say, okay, I'm done. You know, I've actually had people tell me I will never step foot in a Baptist church again. That is so sad. So, so sad. It's a, it's a very sorrowful state. Then there's the shepherd that's searching. The Bible says this in verse number 12. How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them, and he's gone astray, doth he not lead the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? There's the shepherd that's seeking. There's the resolve of the sheep. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, for the Son of Man is to come and to save that which is come to save that which was lost. The great shepherd left more than just the 90 and 9. Amen? Our good shepherd left more than just the 99. He left the ivory palaces of heaven. He left the angels. He left the Father. He left everything to come searching for the strays, you and me, the lost sheep. 
The Bible says this in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patient, and he is long-suffering, and he is merciful. He sends preachers. He sends missionaries. He sends soul winners. He sends a child of God to pass out a track. He uses so many things today to reach the stray. There is the resolve of the shepherd. He's resolved. Well, for that one, whoever that one is, it doesn't say how old or how young they are. It doesn't say, you know, what color the sheep is. Amen. It just, all we know is it's a sheep gone astray. Then there's the reunion with the shepherd. The Bible says this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop unto your soul. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thought, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, and he will not only pardon, but he will abundantly pardon. But first, in order for the Lord to have mercy on him, the Bible says the wicked forsake his way. And what a, what a great reunion that is. And you know just as well as I do in, in your heart when you have been cold or indifferent or apathetic with the Lord, when all of a sudden you realize you're cold or indifferent or apathetic toward the Lord, and you say, uh, I, I have wandered far away from, home, uh, from God, but now I'm coming home. You return to the Lord, and then you know just as well as I do, it's like the Lord and you have that fellowship, that communication, that relationship restored with him. You think the Lord's going to say, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, I'm too busy right now. No. The reunion is something sweet and special that you have. Then there's the rejoicing of the shepherd. The Bible says in verse number 13 of Matthew chapter 18, and if it be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. <clears throat> I'm, I'm working on a message on the prodigal that stayed home. You know, th there is a prodigal that did go astray, but there was also a prodigal that stayed home. And the prodigal that stayed home thought, because he didn't go astray, he was so much better than the prodigal that did go astray, when they were both dealing with a very similar issue that had to do with pride. The prodigal dealt with pride that he didn't want to listen to his father and just go along with the way that this is the way that it should be. The prodigal that stayed home had pride thinking that he was better than everybody else because he didn't do what the prodigal did. Pride. In regard to all the sheep going astray, let, let, me, let me say this. Luke chapter 15, verse number 10, the Bible says this, Likewise they say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repented. Could that also mean one sheep that returned to the fold? In all the years that I've been pastoring, I have seen people come and people go. People leave for what I thought were legitimate reasons. You know, maybe they're, they're legitimate People that left because they were upset. I was thinking about all the, the, the years that I have been pastoring. If I, if I had every single person that ever darkened the door of our church, here, Louisiana, even here, we would already have to build a new building in two years. Isn't it crazy to think? But even there, you'd be there for a long time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people go through the door and out the door, go through the door and out the door. And I have not rejoiced over one that walked out the door. Not one. Even if they did cause problems. Not one. And there have been some times where people have caused problems. That's not the case every time. But every single person that's ever walked out the door, 
think to myself, how much more could they get in life if they would just get over this one issue that they have? Is this something that could be discussed? Is this something that could be resolved? Is this something that could be reconciled? Of course. The amazing thing about marriage, I went and visited Brother Don today. It was nice meeting him. That was the first time I got to meet him. And I'll publicly apologize to Miss Charlene. I said I was going to come over yesterday. I didn't. It wasn't but 6 or 7 o'clock at night that that I realized, oh, and then I realized, well, I guess I'll just wait. Miss Charlene told me that. I'm sorry, Miss Charlene. I told you I was going to be there. So I didn't come. I was wrong for doing that. But I was thinking about uh, Brother Don. I went and go visit him. You and him have been married almost 65 years, right? 130 years. 65 years. You know what causes people to stay together that long? Love, forgiveness, long-suffering, you know, different things of that nature. Now, I know that a person that is a church member will never love me as much as they love their spouse, okay? <laughs> so that's the one we're getting to. But it says a lot about forgiveness and love and long-suffering and patience with it between two people if they can stay together that long. That long. I, I say, man, I, I really hope I could do that as pastor. How about as pastor, anytime anyone does anything wrong, I just decide to leave, right? Man, you'd think I was a coward. I don't love you anyway, right? When I say yes to this church, I say through thick and thin, through rich or poor, and poor and poor, amen, or thicker and thicker, right? Sickness and in health. People don't understand being part of a church is almost symbolically you can see the correlation between a marriage of a husband and wife and a relationship that a person has with the church that they are a member of. You can see that throughout the scriptures. Matter of fact, you could read Ephesians chapter 5, I believe it is, and it talks quite a bit about the mystery between the husband and the wife and Christ and the church and different things of that nature. When you say yes to this church, you say no to all other churches. Just like when you said I do to your spouse, you say I don't to everybody else. But there's always green grass. People, you know, the sheep are chasing the green grass. The grass is always greener over a septic field. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. So you think about all the people that have come, all the people that have gone. Been in church a long time. I'm sure Miss Charlene and Miss Fonda, Miss Alice, Miss Miss Sharon, a long, long time, long time for many years. You've seen people come, people go. You've seen pastors come and pastors go. You've seen pastors when things get tough, they decide to bail out. You've seen pastors come and when things get tough, they get tougher. And they they pull on the, pull up their big boy pants and they just keep plowing forward. But you've seen people come and go through adversity and just keep going and go through adversity and just keep going and go through adversity and be hurt and everything like that and just keep going. For years and years and years, they just keep going. Then you've seen the ones that they got distracted. They got deceived. They, got, they felt like they were deserted. All of those different things. And then they end up leaving. Or they drop out of church altogether. And it's never an easy thing. When you have someone that's going astray, no, let, let me just say this. No matter what, don't, don't forsake the people that are here entirely for the one that has gone astray. Don't forsake all of your family that's with you, all for that. There is the time. I heard a pastor say this, and I'll close with this. I know I'm rambling. He said, pastors and people will lose those wanting to stay, trying to keep those who wanted to leave.
If somebody wants to be a prodigal and they don't want to reconcile, let them go and leave the door open for them if they want to return. Don't burn your bridges with them. If they choose to burn the bridge, that's one thing, but don't you burn your bridge with them because you may have to use that bridge to cross it to go grab them real quick because there's an opportunity to pull them back in. We all are potentially people that could go astray. Prone to wonder, God, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Going astray. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. Why do we do what we do? Why do we run the van? Why do we go pick up the guys from the mission? Why are we trying to start a college ministry? Why are we trying to do these different things just for those that are astray? It is vitally important, I'll say this, I said this at the very beginning before I even passed it here, the moment that this church decides they don't want to get people saved is the moment that I will go. And if we are going to be a church, let's be a church, to try to get people saved, try to bring the lost sheep into the house of God. Try to go get the strays and bring them back. Everywhere you look, they're strays. In the stores, in your neighbor's, in schools, in the library, everywhere you look, they're strays. And God has placed it upon us, not just me, not just pastor, not just pastor's family, but all of us to round up the strays. Amen? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight to see the importance of reaching out to the strays. Lord, I pray you help us use wisdom concerning it, obviously. Lord, there's so much that is involved with